Hello, and welcome back to the Compass Podcast. Today, we have Rusty Russell, a senior developer of Lightning Network at Blockstream. Today, we're talking about how Bitcoin mining and the Lightning Network interact. Be sure to stick around for this conversation. We really get into the nuts and bolts of not only how the Lightning Network works, uh, but why it matters for Bitcoin and how it interacts with the Bitcoin mining ecosystem. Rusty, thank you so much for joining us on today's podcast. Uh, last time we spoke was also the first time we met, which was at the Lightning Conference in Berlin back in 2019. Obviously, a lot has happened both in the Lightning Network world, but also the world in general since then. So it's good to see you again. Good to see you, Will. Yes, uh, it, it was a long time ago. Um, and that was an amazing conference. And I'm hoping we can do it again sometime. Uh, I think everyone is. Uh, so yeah, looking forward to that. Um, it is obscene o'clock here, so I'm on my second coffee. Um, Hopefully, I will be awake to answer your questions um, and that we can sew together something coherent for everyone to hear about uh, about the state of lightning. Definitely. Yeah, this is going to be a great conversation because I've, I've spoken to so many Bitcoin miners over this last year, whether they be public firms, CEOs, all the way down to retail miners who are cobbling a few ASICs together in the garage. And they always have questions about how the lightning network and Bitcoin mining interact. So we're going to hit a few of those off the top. Uh, before we jump into it, though, I want to get an update on Lightning, uh, and even before that, I want to do an update just on where you're at, what you're working on, and how you got into Bitcoin uh, itself and then Lightning. Cool. Okay. Well, let's let's sort of start at the beginning. Um, I got involved in Bitcoin because, like, my background uh, prior to this, uh, I'm a computer programmer, uh, and I worked on Linux back when that was a, sort of a fairly insane uh, thing to do uh, back in the back in the 90s when um, when you know Linux was this sort of radical new way of writing operating systems like these weirdos over the internet get together to write this commercial grade operating system it just seemed like that's not how it's done right that's not how operating systems are made that's, that's kind of weird um, and that ended up becoming my career right so I I, you know, I spent my career um, writing software and giving away for free and getting paid for it so that was a you know I, I never would have anticipated that that would last when I first got you know, when somebody first offered to actually pay me to do my hobby, that was kind of cool. Um, so fast forward, that was that was you know that was my full time gig and everything else. And this, you know, I was always looking for um, other other like you know open source projects that were doing interesting things, and you know I would dabble with them and stuff. Um, you know, I was always into kind of the cypherpunk movement and cryptography and all those kind of cool things. Um, so Bitcoin comes along, of course. You know, I, I wasn't you know I, I wasn't reading the paper and you know. Uh, 2009. It was. It took a couple of years. You know, you got to get hit by it a few times. It kind of, you know, it goes by and passing on various totally. websites and things. And you know, uh, and I finally read the white paper and kind of, went, oh, okay, well, I kind of get what they're trying to do. I, I kind of see that, and I just see it as an interesting kind of, you know, open source project that is doing this cool stuff. So I dabble around, um, and. I guess I never. I, you know, I, I bought some bitcoins and play money. Uh, to, to you know, you had to kind of get your hands on it, right? So you get some, got some bitcoin, and you know, uh, um, yeah, spend it. I bought some like Iranian shoes. Um, you know, you send your bitcoin off, and you're like, I wonder if I'm ever going to see anything. But sure enough, like this package shows up, and there's these like you know these these, these shoes that I might lower my bitcoin shoes, right? Because of course you couldn't get like these, you, you know. Yeah. Uh, you couldn't like you know use Visa, Mastercard to pay for that. So, so yeah, um, that was kind of cool, and just basically frittered away this money, but never really kind of took it seriously. Um, but you know, inevitably, it was there, and it was kind of doing stuff. Um, and at one stage, uh, I was talking about it, and my wife said, like, you know, why don't you take like a sabbatical? Like, why don't you take six mm -hmm. months off? You know, go down the rabbit hole, um, do this thing. Uh, you know, she's like, no, oh, we're kind of head on the mortgage. We can do this. And I'm like, okay, you sure? Yeah. So she was really supportive. She was like, yeah, no, no, no. Uh, you know, uh, mind you, she did say that I was much nicer to live with when I was, you know, working on something I was passionate about. So, mm -hmm. so that was good. Um, so I kind of spent five months playing around, trying to write a, uh, what we would call these days a side chain, um, to handle um, scalable Bitcoin. So, so this idea was like, you'd have this side chain that would be for like petty cash. Like, you know, it wouldn't be as reliable as Bitcoin, but you could always move it back to Bitcoin. But this would be like your, your day wallet for like, for spending stuff, you know, less reliable, but ideally more scalable and all this stuff, right? So I, I toyed around. Right at the end of that, Blockstream comes out with a paper on side chains. And I'm like, crap, that's what I was trying to build. Why didn't you release that paper like six months ago? Obviously yeah. they said, we have to talk to you. Um, I went back to my day job for a bit, but it was kind of obvious. And so I was like, crap, do I join a startup? 
um, and do that. And again, my wife said, yeah, no, you should, <laughs> you should do that. You're much nicer when you're, you're working on stuff that you're really passionate about. So, so yeah, so I, I switched careers. I, you know, uh, and this was, this was around about, uh, seven years ago now. So, uh, it's it's been a while, uh, and I went, oh, cool. I'm gonna get, I'm gonna work on Bitcoin. I'm gonna be like one of the cool kids, you know. It's a C++ project. I'd like, you know, I kind of caught up on my C++. It's been a while, and I was like, okay, I'm ready to work with these kids. And I went across and visited Blockstream, did the whole thing. But while we were in, while we we're talking about joining them, um, the yeah. Lightning Paper dropped, right? Uh, and Lightning Paper was kind of um, it kind of described all the trees, but never described the forest. And so it was really hard to understand. Uh, uh, it took me like three good reads to get through and go, oh, right, that's what they're doing. And so I ended up writing a series of blog posts kind of going, well, this is how you read the lightning paper, right? <laughs> so breaking mm-hmm. down the paper so people can read it. Uh, and a lot of early people got into lightning, at least the tech side, by reading the paper that I'd written. So uh, you know, I was just I was just kind of messing around. It was interesting tech. And uh, Greg Maxwell, the legendary uh, uh, CTO of Blockstream at the time, said to me, Oh yeah, we've decided instead of working on Bitcoin Core, you should like try to implement Lightning. And I'm like, well, that's not. It's kind of a bit of bait. And <laughs> we shouldn't get to work with you guys, you know. But uh, but it was too good an opportunity to pass up. I'm like, yeah, this is this is this is fantastic. This is something that definitely we we felt needed to exist. Um, and at the time, no one was really like they dropped the paper and they're like, but we're not going to do it. And I'm like, well, someone has to do it. So that was yeah. it. So I ended up writing the first Lightning implementation. Um, we ended up. Meeting together in Milan, there were by the, then three groups working on it. Um, we all got together and kind of tried to agree on interoperability. Obviously, that's important, and 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 you know. So now there are like three main implementations, or at least three others uh, out there. Um, and we have this whole process of like, here's here's how we're going to agree on stuff, and and how how we're going to all make sure we talk to each other, and uh, and that all the things interoperate, which is the way it works today. And uh, and yeah, and that has been my last, uh, you know, six and a half years uh, mm-hmm. has been been on that train so uh it's been amazing obviously um it it's i still get up at, at 5 30 in the morning for those early morning spec calls for me um and and yeah it's 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 been a fantastic ride you know out of the backdrop of this of course the bitcoin thing has been has been amazing there's been yeah you know uh so much happening in that space that you know some days i'm like wow it's hard to keep up with all the stuff that's going on, both in the Lightning and, and the Bitcoin space. So that's kind of uh, an overview of, of where I come from and, and how I, I got here. So I'm, I'm a tech person, um, fascinated by Bitcoin and Lightning as, as technology. Um, and of course, you kind of get you know uh, an education in everything else Bitcoin uh, along the way as well. Yeah, yeah. So we just kind of zoom out a little bit if I can. Uh, Lightning paper dropped in 2016, if I'm not incorrect. And then from there, we've seen kind of like a splintering of different teams working on it, kind of keeping that decentralized model where you have C Lightning with Blockstream, where you'll have the L&D uh, with Lightning Labs, and then you have the Eclair guys. Uh, and then there's even like the people just building it themselves. And there's a whole community out there building Lightning. Uh, can we dig into what Blockstream is doing with Sea Lightning and then what your role is there? Uh, and then a little color on the Lightning Network community would also be really interesting. The paper dropped 2015. So, the, the, you know, the, the people talk about 2016. That was like, there was a polished version of the paper, but it didn't matter. The idea was out early on. Uh, that, that paper that was kind of like all the pieces, but none of the kind of coherence was 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 early. It was, was 2015. Um, and that, that gave everyone the idea. Okay, so then, then the idea was out there. It's like, okay, so this is what we're going to build. Um, and, and there were a few refinements on the idea. So um, I started C Lightning um, because my background is Linux and that's written in C, hence C Lightning. It was, it was the obvious choice. Um, then we had... Um, Lightning Labs. So, so Joseph Poon and uh, Taj Dryja, who were the co-authors of the Lightning Paper, um, did end up founding a company to do this. Originally, they were like, "Oh no, we, we have other things to do." But they, you know, it was, it was getting pretty exciting. People were really, really hot about it. Were, so they they founded Lightning Labs. Now they've since both left, but the the company was, continues to go very very strong. So um, so they they have LND um, and uh, uh, Async um, uh, in in Paris. Um, produced Eclair and, and now Phoenix, um, and they have their implementation. Uh, so we all kind of, um, we, okay, so how does this work? Um, everyone, anyone can produce, like there's a whole series of, of um, 
uh, of, of specs called bolts because we love our love our lightning puns, right? Basis of lightning technology, uh, and that is uh, it. Basically, tells you, okay, so if you want to if you want to work with the lightning work, here's here's how you do it. And so you could go and you could build your own thing uh, from scratch. No, it's kind of complicated. It's taken us a while to kind of iterate on this, but um, but yeah, there's there's other teams who've come along on cool. Um, we're going to implement that and interoperate with it, particularly things like Electrum, um, which uh, is is a, like a standard kind of Bitcoin node and server, but can also speak Lightning. Um, and they wrote their stuff from scratch. So um, in my mind, uh, chairing and running that spec process and making sure that that works, um, the software can be replaced. Like you can rewrite that. But this, this, the protocols and the stuff we talk, um, that's a lot harder to kind of, that's the plumbing, right? And so C Lightning almost exists inside Blockstream so that we can make sure that the spec makes sense, right? You can go, oh, we should do this. But unless you actually do it, you can't really be sure that's the right way of doing it. So you kind of got to do both. So C Lightning is very spec focused. We, you know, we, we write the spec and we, uh, everyone on the team is involved with the spec process and with writing the code and making it all work. So a lot of experimental stuff that's, that, you know, that, uh, we're, we're looking at doing in the spec is, uh, implemented in C Lightning first as an experimental kind of option and, and we kind of get to play with it. So the rules of the spec are you've got to get two teams to implement it independently. They both got to go away, you know, read the spec and try to make it work. Then they've got to make sure it interoperates and works correctly. And we find all kinds of issues at that point. The spec wasn't well written. It didn't mention some corner case and we interpreted it differently, whatever else. Or often they look at it and they go, oh, why don't we just do it this way? That'd be simpler or that'd be better or whatever. So there's a you know, so the specs never actually final until you've got two teams who both implement it. They make sure it works together. They're both happy with it, and then finally it gets finalized in the spec, and it's open slather. Anyone, anyone should should go and should go and do it. So there's a whole process there to make sure that it's it's solid, it's interoperable, and everything else. And that process has been going on for six years. I used to chair the spec meetings early on. That was you know that was kind of my role. Um, uh, but yeah, I found doing that at 5.30 in the morning was a little bit taxing. Now we rotate uh, the chair. Uh, so it kind of goes around. Um, and that, yeah, uh, that process worked extremely well. Um, but there's lots of extension points. So, you know, implementations will go off and do their own thing uh, in a way that's compatible with everyone else as well. So they can kind of, okay, if there's, if there's two nodes that know this extension, then they can both use that as well. So there's a whole process there. Uh, so the C-Lightning team inside Blockstream is now uh, five people. Uh, we've taken on another couple of people this year. Um, we're looking at expanding at least one more, uh, maybe a couple. There's, you know, there's so much stuff to do uh, in this space that, you know, uh, for a long time, we tried to keep this team size kind of lean and, and keep it low. Uh, but Blockstream had a funding round recently. Uh, and part of that was just to expand and, and push out. And that is very much what's happening with, uh, with the C-Lightning team. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of, that's, that's that, um, should we step back and talk about like what the lightning network is? Cause we've been talking about it mm -hmm. in a sense of like, it's a thing. Um, but I know you wanted to kind of give an overview for those who are now going, okay, so he's doing this thing, but I have no idea what this thing is. Yeah. We're just kind of hyping up uh, the whole topic and some good context before we dive into what the lightning network is, is why it matters. And I think data speaks to that better than anything else, uh, particularly dollar signs. So if you look at the lightning network this year, uh, we've seen that it's about $142 million is locked on chain, which might be the incorrect way of saying it, but it's a lot of Bitcoin. Uh, I think it's see 3,300 Bitcoin, right? Uh, at this current moment. And tons of new nodes on the network. And then even past that, there's different ways you can set up a node where it's not even noticeable on network. And so that the node count is probably far higher. Uh, it really has taken off. And, and uh, another little quote for context, Dragonfly Capital uh, has a, is a firm out there that kind of invests in tons of coins on the network. And they recently did a live stream kind of talking about all the different coins what, that surprised them in 2021. Uh, these people are infamously bearish on Bitcoin and bearish on Bitcoin correlated assets. And yet they said they were shocked and surprised by how well the Lightning Network performed this past year and that people in other altcoin worlds are not paying attention to Lightning and it's to their own loss. And, and that comes from, again, Dragonfly Capital, which is uh, investing in alternative products that are not Bitcoin. So I think it's really important for people to take a note of where Lightning is right now and where it's going. Uh, so with all that context in mind, I want to hand it back to you, Rusty. Kind of tell us what Lightning is, how state channels work, how it operates uh, on top of Bitcoin. 
Yeah. Wow. How do I unpack that? Okay. So, um, <laughs> well, yeah. so, so doing it as a comparison to altcoins is kind of a weird way of doing it because it's, um, so, so lightning is Bitcoin, right? So, so let's get this sorted out to start with, right? So, um, we have to unpack a little bit about what, what does it mean when you say you're holding Bitcoin, right? Uh, it doesn't mean you're physically holding it, right? Cause it's not, that's not how Bitcoin works, obviously. Um, but we have all this, this confusing nomenclature about, oh, wallets and stuff like that. And wallets aren't really wallets at all. Um, and stuff like that. So, so let's talk about what it means to, to actually hold Bitcoin. And what it means to me is that it means you can spend your Bitcoin. You can move it, right? You could, you have the power to instruct the shared ledger that everyone, everyone's using, uh, the Bitcoin blockchain to, to commit a transaction that spends it somewhere else, right? Now, normally the way you do that is you've got your secret key inside your hardware wallet or your phone or whatever it is, right? And your secret key can, can sign this transaction that everyone will accept, right? Um, and that there are some Bitcoin that are, you know, are waiting for the a signature from that, the, your, the key that only you hold, um, to move your Bitcoin, right? That's usually what I mean. When you say you hold Bitcoin, that means you can make signatures. You can make transactions to move it. Okay. Um, okay. So, so what matters is that, that transaction thing, right? So, okay. Um, but you can do weirder stuff with Bitcoin. And that's the thing. I mean, you know, that's the simplest way of using it. Yeah. Okay. We have a, what we call a single sig, right? You need one signature. You've got the magic, uh, the magic secret that lets you make those signatures and they're your Bitcoin. But, you know, uh, Will and I could set up some weird thing where you go, okay. Well, what if we need, we put some coins in so that we need two signatures. We need his signature and my signature, right? He's got one signature, I've got the other, and then we can move the coins. Do I own those coins? Well, not really, because Will could be kind of a dick, right? And, and refuse to sign, and then I'm like, I'm stuck. Um, okay, so that, that would be dumb. But, but what if, okay, what if we had something even more complicated? It's like, okay, right, so we have to both sign. But before we start, Will give me his signature. Like, okay, cool, it, it moves it off to cold storage for you, Rusty. So... At any point, of course, I can make my, my signature and I've got this complete transaction and I can move those coins. Do I own them then? Well, yeah, because I can move them. Um, so let's say yes, at that point I own them. So, okay. So if we have a thing where Will and I both need to sign, but he always, but I always make sure he gives me his signature. I own those coins. They're mine. Okay. This is kind of a weird setup. Like it's not kind of what we're used to, but I definitely hold those coins. And that's really all the light network is. So Will and I go, okay, cool. Let's go. We're going to put some funds in and we're going to both need to sign off on it, right? But before we do that, you give me your signature. So if, if you disappear or stop behaving or whatever, I'm literally holding that signature in my hot little hand or my hot little computer in this case, right? And, uh, you know, and I can add my signature and I can move the coins and we're done. So now I know my coins are safe. I own them. I hold them. We're all good. Okay. Now, why would I do that? Like, what's the point of doing this weird thing? Well, it turns out that if we do this, if I put like a, you know, if I put a Bitcoin in or, you know, I'm not that rich. Okay. So I put like, you know, uh, I put a million sats in, he puts a million sats in. Um, and we have a, you know, but before we do that, before we put it in, uh, I want to, I want something that kind of, that I want a transaction that gives me my million back, gives him his million back. I'll give you my signature. You give me your signature. We're all good to go. Okay. So, okay. We make sure we got the signature. We check it. We're all good. Great. I will put the coins in. We've got a million each. Great. Okay. Now, what's the point of that? It's kind of a weird setup. Well, what we can do is, okay, now if I want to give Will, you know, 100,000 sats, I just go, well, let's just sign another one that gives, you know, let's give you, what do they say? 1,100,000. It gives me 900,000. Um, we both I'll exchange. Take more sats. Just yeah, give them my yeah, way. Cool. Yeah, here you go. So he's, he's, uh, he's, he's getting a little bit richer. Uh, I'm like, okay, great. So here. Uh, let's sign a new signature, a new transaction that gives you more and gives me less. Okay. And we swap signatures. We check they're good. Okay. So we can kind of do this. We can just keep changing up our, our transactions. We don't actually have to spend that transaction. We don't actually have to push it out of the blockchain and go through and wait for mine and everything. Because I know it, it, it'll happen, right? I'm holding a signature. I've checked it. It's all good. I can do that anytime I need. So we can just keep you know, bumping sats back and forth by signing new transactions, right? Without bothering anyone else, right? Now that's kind of cool. If, if if you know, like uh, we're paying each other all the time um, for stuff, you know, he's, he's buying my coffees, I'm you know, uh, or whatever. Uh, I don't know. So there's some kind of arrangement, but that that's kind of a weird arrangement. There's very few times where you know you have a single person you're paying all the time, and, and they're paying you back and forth. But the trick with the Lightning Network is there's a magic way that if he's got a connection like this and he's got this kind of set up with someone else, I can pay that other person through him. So I can go, okay, cool. Tell you what, I'll give you a hundred thousand sats. If you get, or I'll give you a hundred thousand one sats. If you can get a hundred thousand sats through to, you know, Joe over there. Right. So 
not a problem. Um, uh, and we can do that in a way that's trustless, right? I don't have to trust him. It'll either go through or it won't. But unless he makes the payment, he's not getting paid, right? And that's the trick of the Lightning Network. We use atomic swaps and all this technology. But uh, at the end of the day, as more people connect and set this stuff up, you can pay through to any one of those routing through, okay, I'll go through there and I'll hop through Joe and then I'll go to Jamie, you know, uh, and, and I've, I figured out this way of doing it and I can kind of push payments back and forth. And suddenly now it's not just that I will pay and will all the time, just I can pay anyone else through that. Right. So this is the, this is the light network, right? Now it has a couple of interesting properties, right? Uh, one of the properties is that it's fast, right? You know, we've got to exchange the signatures. We've got to check them and everything else, but that's pretty quick. You know, the inter- the internet, you know, uh, uh, computers are pretty fast at this stuff. That's pretty lightning. Yeah, it's going to have to go through a few hops. So that has to happen a few times. But then, you know, payments like, you know, way under a second. Uh, we're looking milliseconds in most cases, um, you know, around the world. Even, even if you start adding up a few hops, we're still talking, you know, a few seconds to make a payment. Um, and once we've got the payment, I'm literally holding that signature, right? That gives the coins back to me. So if anything goes wrong... Okay, well, now I've got to go on chain. And yeah, I've got to pay some fees at that point, of course, um, to you miners out there to mine that transaction for me. Uh, but unless something goes wrong, I don't need to. I can just leave it there and I know I'm good. So always holding that uh, Bitcoin transaction ready to go in my heart of the lands, right? So uh, it's fast, but it is also not credit. It's literally uh, the payment's done. I've got the transaction ready to go, right? Sure, yeah, I've got to put it on chain if I want it, but I can always just keep using it, right? So, so that makes it a kind of a weird beast. It's, it's really fast. Um, it has this weird setup phase where you've got to kind of bind, bind this two of two transaction and do all that stuff. So there's a weird kind of setup. But once you're on board, you can pay anyone else on the network, you know? Um, now, obviously, we're talking about pushing SATs to people. So, you know, there needs to be enough SATs. You know, if I'm trying to pay uh, whoever it was I was trying to pay, if they don't literally have enough SATs, in their channel, this two of two thing to get in. Well, that's not going to happen, right? Obviously, I can't push money that's not there. So you do have some liquidity requirements. Um, I need to have enough going out, right? So if uh, if I've already used up all those sats, I'm going to have to like you know top that up somehow. So you know there there are certainly um, uh, reasons why it's hard to make really big payments, but for small payments, it works really really well. Um, and the definition of small payments is moving, right? When I was looking at the Lightning Network seven years ago, small payment, you know, we're thinking like ten bucks, right? We're thinking, oh, that's that's kind of yeah. now small payments is like a thousand bucks, right? So uh, it helps that the Bitcoin prices moved up, uh, but also the network's mm-hmm. mature. There's like some big nodes out there that will you know not bat an eyelid at that kind of money going through, right? So um, so that has definitely gotten a lot. Uh, a lot easier to work, um, and yeah, the the network is still, you know, I would consider kind of small when you look at a population of like world population of billions, but you know, it is definitely growing. And it's at that point now where anyone joining the network uh, has that benefit of you know <clears throat> of, of access to everyone else on the network, and you know, you get those network effects. You go, cool. Oh, there's enough people on the Lightning Network now that it makes sense for me to take some of my precious Bitcoin and kind of put it in a channel so that I can spend it. Right. The other thing I mentioned, of course, is that. When someone makes a payment through you, you are setting your fees, right? You're saying, "Hey, you know, I, I want some, you know, I want some Sats for this." Obviously, I've got, you know, my Bitcoin's not in cold storage; it's being used. I want some reward. Um, so people get to set, "Hey, here's here's what fees I want to charge." And you know, obviously, when I'm routing through trying to figure a path, I'm generally trying to pick one of the cheaper ones. So there's competition for fees. Uh, but you know, if you've got a nice chunky channel and you can make big payments and other people can't, you can charge some kind of premium on fees. So people are, you know, people are out there trying to, you know, optimize their nodes and figure out the best connections and who to have channels with and all this stuff so that they can make more money on the Lightning Network. Look, and that's fantastic. I wish them the best of luck. I'm I'm terrible at optimizing my node. It doesn't. It definitely does not make money. Like it's there for testing purposes. But you know, the fact there's a whole pe- bunch of people who are like obsessed about trying to like jump on these streams to get this money. And you know, the harder they fight, the more competitive they are, and the more they're trying to make sure that my payment goes through. Um, you know, that's all win, right? I'm like, cool. If you mm-hmm. if you figure out a better way to to make fast cheap payments between two people, you will make more money and you'll make the network better. So we're seeing a lot of that. Um, I'm not advising people to like take their stack and go put it on the line network so they can make lots of money because you're not going to. It's very competitive. Um, but on the other hand, I'm like, I don't want to discourage you too much because that's helping everyone if you do it, right? So 
So this is the, the dynamic. But most, what's happening generally today is other than a few people who are out there you know, basically putting their money in to try to make money, um, most people are using it because it's damn useful. If you need to get payments uh, you know, of, of that kind of order, uh, especially across borders um, where it's just painful, um, it is by far the fastest way to do it. Um, mm -hmm. It's fast in a, in a way that, that is really hard to grasp because it's final, right? It's done. Um, yeah. once it's, in, it's, it's done. There's, there's no, there's nothing else. <laughs> you know, a few seconds later, your money has moved, uh, for better or worse, it's gone. So, uh, that finale is just something we're really not used to dealing with. Like credit cards stuff that are fast, but they're not really because there's this huge lag before anyone gets any money. Whereas this is done, right? You're, you've made your payment. It's across already. Um, and that takes a hell of a lot of getting used to. Uh, well, I think you might remember the beer tap at, uh, um, at the lightning conference, uh, three years ago. And there was a beer tap and, you know, you'd, you'd, you'd pay some sats and the beer would come out of the tap. Uh, but there was a warning on it that make sure you put your cup under first because people are not used to the speed. Yeah. Right? And I remember I'll, that. <laughs> I'll pay, and then I'll put the cup under and it was just messy. Right. Because they'd pay yeah. and it'd start pouring out and they're like, crap, you know? So, you know, there, there's this whole, uh, beer tap problem with lightning that, that it takes a while to get used to just how fast it is. You go back to any other payment method and you're like, Oh, I remember how painful this was. Right. So to step back from my point of view, lightning finally makes Bitcoin that payment network we all dreamed of. Right. When you first heard about Bitcoin, you're like, cool, I can send money around the world. You're like, okay. Yeah. Well, you can, but you know, there's going to take it. It's going to take at least a couple of confirmed to make sure it's actually gone through. Um, and that can take, you know, maybe uh, nominally 10, but sometimes 40 kind of, you know, whatever minutes and everything else. And, you know, it's free. Well, it's not free. Like, you know, there's, you've got to pay a fee. It's a minor fee. And it, you know, and, and if you try and pay a dollar, it's not really going to work. It's going to need to be more and everything. All that stuff. Forget all that, right? No, it really does work. It really is incredibly cheap. The fees are pretty much proportional to the amount you're sending. Unlike Bitcoin, where like you're kind of paying by weight, um, yeah. this is literally paying by amount. People will charge you proportionally to how much you're sending because that's how much liquidity you're using. So it's back to that. It's instant. It's fast. It's worldwide. It's all those things that 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 when you first heard about Bitcoin as a payment technology, at least back you know uh, when I was introduced to Bitcoin, it was like wow, it brings all that back. Uh, so that to me is why. Lightning is exciting is because it, it finally delivers all that promise of Bitcoin as a payment network, which was something that was looking kind of shaky, right? It was like, well, you know, maybe Bitcoin's a, maybe it's a storage network. Maybe this is like gold. Uh, and you can move it if you have to, but you don't want to because, you know, fees are high and, and it's, it's hard and it takes a while and you're going to wait, right? Not anymore. With Lightning for small payments, uh, it's, it's absolutely a game changer. No, I totally echo what you're saying. Uh, my first successful payment, I think, was using a Lightning uh, wallet, Blue Wallet. Uh, all the payments before that, I remember first getting into Bitcoin and I bought some Bitcoin on Coinbase, uh, everyone shutter, and then totally like lost it. I had no idea how to like use it correctly and just just totally flubbed it. Uh, but using a Lightning network wallet was like pretty simple, especially Blue Wallet. They have a great interface, and boom bought some coffee with it and uh, didn't think twice. And I think like there's a few threads we can kind of pick up on uh, on the conversation going forward. But uh, one thing that is just kind of curious about what you're saying is the finality. If you talk to anybody who's in the credit card system or credit card industry, anybody who's kind of working with money moving across borders, moving between accounts, that finality just does not exist in the traditional system. Uh, there's always lags. There's always costs. And those costs is that 2 to 3% fee that you're paying that you don't even know about every time you use a traditional banking system. That's something Bitcoin fixes. Uh, but let's leave that conversation on the side for now and talk about how mining and lightning interact. Because this is definitely a conversation that's not only going to grow in importance, but it's also a conversation that a lot of Bitcoin miners are wanting to hear about. Uh, so when we're talking about state channels, as I understand it, how do those systems interact with something like Bitcoin? Uh, maybe we can kind of like go from the small to the big, how uh, liquid or not liquid, rather, uh, lightning kind of interacts on top of Bitcoin. 
how Bitcoin miners process Lightning and if they do, how they get paid for it, all that good stuff. So we we talked about, I have to set this channel up, right? I have to put this two of two signature, this fancy, that weird, weird transaction together. We have to do that. So that, that's one transaction required to, to open a channel, as we say, to like to set up your connection to Lightning Network. That requires a transaction, right? So that's got to be a normal, no, it's, it's a Bitcoin transaction. It's a little bit bigger than a normal one. So, you know, it's uh, it, it pays a bit more perhaps. Um there's that. Uh, and then at some point, if we want to close out, either because, you know, you've gone offline, I can't reach you. And I'm like, okay, I want my funds back. I figure you're gone. Um, or, you know, I want to open another channel with someone else, maybe whatever reason, um, there'll be another transaction. Um, now that could look, that could be a pretty, pretty small tight transaction. If you're online, we both agree. We kind of just negotiate a fee and we go, cool, let's just do that. Otherwise, it has to be kind of a more complicated transaction because there could be payments in progress and there's all this stuff that transaction gets pretty big at that point, uh, which is good for miners. Um, so, you know, that, that, that's, that's kind of a higher fee transaction. There may be like, I may have some urgency behind that. So I may also be like bumping the fees up to, to push that through. So uh, every time someone gets on the Lightning Network, uh, a transaction goes out on the, the Bitcoin Network. And every time somebody like adjusts something uh, or you know, moves capital around, they, they either take something off, they, maybe they push some stuff out to cold storage, there's another on-chain transaction. So, and whenever we get in trouble in the Lightning Network, the other person breaks the rules or refuses to offer a signature or anything else, we also, what we call drop chain, we basically take that sig- the transaction we're holding, we go, right, that's it, you're done. We drop it on the Bitcoin blockchain, knowing that that's going to, you know, it's going to mine, it's going to go through, we get our funds back that way, right? So, um, so, so the blockchain is kind of our thing of last resort as well. You can kind of think of it as our courthouse, like we're making this agreement all the time. And if you break the agreement, that I just go to the court, I go to the judge and go, hey, here, here Bitcoin, so, you know, <laughs> cash this in. You know exactly what's going to happen because we've agreed to that beforehand, right? So, um, so, so the transactions still flow. And certainly in the growth uh, phase of the Lightning Network, uh, there's a lot of people, you know, coming on board and there's, you know, a lot more uh, transaction happening. So, so there's that. There's this idea called splicing um, and there's a draft out for this, but no one has implemented it yet. Where we have a live channel and we decide to throw some funds in while it's live, or, or you know, tap some funds out, right? Uh, and and that would involve another transaction as well. So increasingly, what we'll see is we'll see this kind of background hum of transactions flying around just just to as people go on the line network and, and go off and everything else. Um, in fact, if you try to do the math on how long it would take, if, if everyone you know, we, if we get a billion users on the line network, or you know. Uh, like 5 billion, uh, how long would it take? And like, basically we will fill blocks for like 20 years or something. Like there's a, there's a lot uh, of pressure on miners to mine transactions just for the light network. Now, every time we make a little payment that doesn't get mined. Right. So that, that's the whole point about layer, layer two, right? Um, we have this, this, this neat tight Bitcoin blockchain, um, and we're not overwhelming it. We're using it like as a springboard. Um, but we don't need to bounce on it all the time. Right. So, so that, that's where we get our scalability from. But, um, so when you look at miners, there, there, there was an early argument going, hold on, is this going to undercut miner profitability? Which is a very good question, right? Um, if no one's using the Bitcoin blockchain, they're all just using Lightning. Hey, well, maybe, maybe it'll turn to a ghost town. Um, now that can't happen. Uh, one reason is we rely on the Bitcoin blockchain for the whole thing to work, right? All the hard cases, we just, we, we go, right, we're going to spend the transaction now. Um, secondly, as I said, we require that to get on board and off board. Um, and thirdly, uh, it doesn't work very well for big transfers, right? Because you'd have this liquidity requirement. You've got to find enough hops that have that can push, you know, say a whole Bitcoin through. Um, that's increased, you know, that, that's difficult. It's possible, but it's difficult. But the other point is even if you could make that work uh, and reliability starts to fall off a cliff, you know, around about uh, you know, once you get north of a million, you know, 10 million sats, it starts to get kind of dicey. Um, then because fees are proportional on the Lightning Network, at some point, it's cheaper to just do an on-chain payment, right? You're like, well, actually, um, so I think of, uh, if you think of miners as a courier, right? Um, and you're paying, you know, they don't care. And, and you're sending money through a courier, like, and they're charging you by weight, right? Um, and so that's how I think of like uh, Bitcoin mining is they're charging by weight. They don't care how much money is involved. They care about the weight, right? So if you send a whole crap load of pennies, it could cost you more than you're actually sending, right? Uh, but you know, you're sending sending some some large bills. It might be fine. And so, um, because the Lightning Network is more a traditional kind of model where you're paying by the amount you're sending. Um, at some point, they cross over and you go, "Well, actually, just just send it on chain, right?" If you're trying to send a whole Bitcoin, at some point, you go, "Well, uh, maybe you're better off just paying your on chain fees and sending the Bitcoin 
you know, uh, just, just on chain, easy. Just do a normal transaction, it's all done, right? So there's, there's, there's this kind of trade off there uh, that will always exist. Right. I expect lightning fees, which are, you know, a lot of them are hobbyists and, and things like that. I expect lightning fees will climb over time. And so we'll, we'll figure out exactly where that crossover point is, where you go, just, just send me the money on chain, but you're not going to be paying for your car on the lightning network, right? That's not a thing that your Lambo is definitely going to be an on chain transaction. It depends right? on how nice of a car you have, right? Because oh, yeah, yeah. some okay, of us yeah. are rocking like the cheap cars to stack more Bitcoin. So <laughs> yeah, you know, hey, I'll, look, I'll hey, looking you, for that. If you're down there, maybe maybe you're you know you're sending like your 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 300 bucks over Lightning to pay for your car. In which case, yeah, you're, you're <laughs> and hey, maybe you're <laughs> with the amount of repairs you'll be paying. Maybe you'll be doing regular Lightning payments to keep that thing. <laughs> up, you know, so um, so there's that. But but you, you zoom out a little bit and you go, Lightning makes Bitcoin more useful, right? Um, and so if you're a, if you're in the ecosystem and you're looking at okay, so so. What is Bitcoin good for? Why is it useful? Why is it worth anything? You know, cool. Well, it's this kind of digital storage technology. You can kind of, you know, you can store your funds in it and it's, you know, a protection against inflation, all these things, right? You go, okay, well, that's good. But now it's also a payment network. Now it's also this weird thing where I can send five bucks to El Salvador. And, you know, that's this whole, it opens this whole new door to usage. So if you're holding Bitcoin or you're relying on something, the Bitcoin price, this whole new story about how it can be used and this whole potential use case um, has just made your asset more useful. So I think that story is good for everyone in the ecosystem, right? And really, really interesting. And I guess the final point uh, for, for miners is if you're a small miner and you're getting payouts, uh, and your producer actually, uh, made this point early on, I think it's really good. Is Shout that, to Damien. yeah, thanks Damien. Um, is that, you know, uh, as on-chain fees climb, uh, or if you're in a high fee environment, then, you know, if you're, if you're getting paid for, by your, uh, your mining pool, uh, a small amount, it's like you can lose a chunk of that in fees. Right. Uh, whereas if they've got lightning set up, then, you know, they can trickle those funds out to you. They can trickle them out a lot closer to real time as well. They don't have to bash them quite as aggressively. Um, so you end up with like a lower latency on your payments, but also, you know, um, much, much lower fees. So that, that's a really good use case for lightning. Um, so even miners start using lightning because it's just useful, right? Sure. If you're a big miner and you're getting paid about Bitcoin at a time, that's fine. You know, do that on chain. But increasingly, I think we'll see, you know, retail miners using lightning simply because it's the easiest way to get their funds, right? Um, so I expect to see that growth definitely. So, you know, it is a new use and it is coming into its own as a thing, even for people who don't care about Bitcoin, right? They're just like, I like that finale. I like the fact that I can make these payments. I like the fact that it works everywhere in the world. I like the fact there's a network of, of places I can send Bitcoin to. Um, and as that grows, I think it just it lifts all the boats. Totally, totally. Yeah, no, I can see that use case being very valuable if we kind of see a return to high fees. Obviously, the last six months we've been in uh, some fee doldrums, but who knows? Might pop back up. Uh, one kind of clarification question that I do get asked a lot by many miners is what does this look like in the long term? How much activity is going to be put on the Lightning Network and therefore push down fees on the main chain and hurt Bitcoin miners? Uh, this really gets complex when you think of the halvenings continuing going forward and the Coinbase reward dropping. Uh, there's a lot of people out there who think that Lightning Network might be a menace to the main chain at some certain point. Uh, but of course, it's always an open question. We don't really know, um, but curious to get your thoughts. So this is true things. If, if lightning really takes off, we've got like a good decade plus of just people getting on board, right? <laughs> and they're, they're, they're paying fees to get on board. Uh, particularly if we end up with a crush, right? Everyone's trying to get on. Um, and it, it's kind of self-fulfilling, right? At some point, it's so expensive to get on that the lightning network growth slows because, you know, people are trying to mine those transactions and stuff. So, so there'll, there'll be this, this interesting balance. Um, as things grow. So, but in the long term, uh, you do end up in this steady state where, you know, um, maybe most people are using Lightning for their 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 day-to-day -day transactions and, you know, they're using uh, on-chain only for like large transfers, right? You know, if you're buying a house or something, that's you doing that on Lightning. Um, so, you know, you're doing that on-chain, not on Lightning, but you're buying your coffee on Lightning, right? Um, and every so often there's penalty transactions. Somebody goes down, you're unreachable, you've got to close, you know, you do that on chain as well. Um, you know, somebody new joins the network, you know, they go on. There's going to be rebalancing and stuff like that that still happens. So, um, but at that point, you know, if you've got your billion people on Lightning, 
just the, just the periphery, just every so often when they need to rebalance or everything else and going on chain, that by itself is significant amounts of traffic. Um, now, what we've seen is with the fee environment at the moment is really kind of interesting. Um, some of that is possibly lightning, although to be honest, not much of it, because the kind of fee things people are doing on lightning are stuff they weren't going to be doing on Bitcoin because they're, you know, uh, you could technically do them today because fees are so low, but you wouldn't build a business on on five dollar payments on 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 Bitcoin. You're going to be steamrolled. Next time fees go up, your business will vanish, right? So nobody would be building those businesses, but they are. They're building them on Lightning because they can. So it's almost like there's a hole where we just couldn't exist, and there's a lot of stuff happening in that because of Lightning. So I don't think we're seeing sub- uh, a subtractive thing playing out yet. Certainly, uh, we are seeing more. You know. Just the fact that people are doing batching and stuff like that, if they've finally woken up the fact that, that the normal state, the healthy state of Bitcoin is high fees, right? Uh, someone's got to pay the miners, right? Because they're doing, you know, they're securing the network. That's their job. And that's, that's, those fees have got to be paid. So those fees are going to rise over time. Um, but there's a cliff edge, right? If there is enough block space for everyone, fees fall to basically zero. As soon as there isn't quite enough fees rise to almost an arbitrary point, right? So there's a real cliff edge. If we've got enough block space, then fees are zero. If we don't have quite enough block space, then fees start to climb. And they can climb really fast. So don't be fooled into thinking... So so literally, if we've got like an average of, say, 2 meg blocks, and we're only using 1.8 meg, fees are zero. If we try to use 2.1 meg, then suddenly it's a bidding war. It's all on, and fees will jump, right? So you can't, you can't look at... Um, so, so fees are discontinuous, right? They're like zero, 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 zero. Shit, they're a lot, right? Um, so it's hard to look at the network and go, oh, well, fees are going to be low forever. And you're like, no, no, no. They've just got to tip over. We've just got to hit that point where where no, where we can't quite fit stuff in blocks, and suddenly it's a bidding war, right? So don't look at the calm seas at the moment and go, well, it's ages away. We're never going to have high fees. Like, no, we could that could happen any day. It could happen any time. Um, it could particularly happen if there's a rush onto the Lightning network. That by itself could push enough transactions through that blocks suddenly fill up and and fees start to go up. And it's a bidding war of who's going to get in, who's going to miss out. Um, And so we'll see these fee spikes come back again. And we know in the long term, as you say, for Bitcoin security, we're going to be paying. At the moment, the Bitcoin network subsidized, right? That's the, 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 the coins that are dropping, right? Every time you mine a block, that is supposed to fade out. We all know that. Um, and to be paid by a user pay system, right? And it's going to be Lightning users who are going to be paying for a lot of that, um, which I think is really exciting. And you know, there's there's different ways of kind of cramming more users onto. It. We're already looking to the next stage. Like, okay, so if fees are like I don't know, if fees are like a hundred bucks to open and close a channel, that starts to really cut into the uses of Lightning. So how do we get more people on a channel? How do we do more batching? How do we kind of drive that back down again? And so there's this healthy like um, green zone. Where fees are in the point where, you know, miners are healthy and everything else, but not so high that you can't use the line network because no one can get on, right? So we're all Mm -hmm. kind of in this this zone where we're trying to figure out what things are going to happen. And we don't have much to play with. We have a few technology options here uh, to kind of squeeze more things in. Um, uh, But, you know, it's going to be an interesting dynamic to see how that works. Um, But it's pretty clear that there is a healthy fee market there, right? Um, you can't see it at the moment because we're underwater, but the moment we poke above uh, the point where blocks are full, um, and we've done all the obvious stuff now, right? We've kind of we've got our segwit. Um, we've, people are doing batching. We're, you know, we're, we're seeing all that. There are a few more technological things we can try to squeeze some more in, but it's not enough. You know, blocks are going to get full. Prices are going to rise. Um, and that pushes through to the light network as well, right? Because if it costs this much for me to set up a channel, and I'm one of these people supplying liquidity... I got to pass it on to my users, right? I'm like, I need to, I need to do a transaction a day just to adjust and rebalance everything so I can make sure everything's running smoothly. Well, that pa- that cost goes on. So what happens is lightning fees also start to rise. Now that's cool because they are so low at the moment. There's a lot of room upwards before people care, right? They're way sub one percent, um, and they probably need to be somewhere between a tenth and, and a single percentage, depending on how much you're sending and, and stuff like that. But but I would expect you know lightning fees will rise at the moment, you know. We're taking a free ride as well because we can create channels really cheap because fees are so low. That's going to end. So, you know, I expect costs to go up, um, but the Lightning Network is still, you know, at that cheap point. So there's going to be some crossover where it's like, yeah, okay, so Lightning's a percentage. And at some magic point, you just go on chain because, you know, you're like, it's, 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 it's going to be cheaper than Lightning. So, yeah, again, 
as you said before, we're projecting to the future and seeing what's happening. But uh, Lightning taking off in the short term is very, very good for miners. Um, and having the having the, the fact that Bitcoin had this ability to do this uh, is one both mind blowing, right? So there were a couple of tweaks required. Uh, we needed a couple of soft forks, but we could have kind of you know generally worked around that. The fact that Bitcoin had this ability to do the Lightning Network, which wasn't invented when Satoshi. Came up, you know, he had a few different ideas that were similar, but really to crystallize it and make this trustless lightning network on top of Bitcoin. The fact that we can build that is kind of mind blowing, um, and and a fantastic sign for all the other cool things that we can build with the Bitcoin we already have. Right? Um, it's kind of like your money getting upgraded underneath you is kind of a weird feeling, right? But even if you never use the lightning network, the fact that it's there uh, is is incredibly. Uh, powerful statement about what Bitcoin is and what mm. Bitcoin is. It's, it's funny that the conversation circled back to fees because that's kind of how uh, you and I first met was talking about how Lightning was going to engineer its fee market back in 2019. And there was kind of like some thoughts going back on the, the L&D channels so talking about like, should we set like a maximum or a minimum or should it just be started at one sat? Like, how are we going to kind of create this market at X and ELO? And you know, the question is still out there because you really are just engineering an entire market on chain. Uh, kind of as we kind of close out the conversation here, roadmap, what is next for Lightning? What's next for you? And what kind of things are you looking forward to? Uh, there's a whole heap of stuff. There's a whole heap of technical stuff that's coming down the pipe for Lightning. Um, you know, obviously, uh, with Taproot in, um, we're looking at bringing that into Lightning, um, using some of that capability. Um, one of the cool things is is that our transactions in the friendly case where we both agree get smaller they look like every other taproot transaction so that's good for everyone um we have um there's some other cool things about basically making the network uh sort of more private more robust uh, at the moment if you see a payment go through and you happen to control two nodes that go through you can tell it's the same payment uh there is you know Taproot enables some stuff that we can do now where we can decorrelate payments so you can't necessarily tell, which is kind of good for the network. Nobody wants to know. Um, it's much better if you can you can keep things more anonymous. Uh, we've already done a lot of work on that. There's more to come uh, on keeping that. Um, the, the payment network is kind of um, just a transport that knows very little about what's going on. That's, that's just good for everyone. So we're going to see more on the, that front. Uh, and privacy, I think, is, is a big issue for me as a, as a tech geek. So that, that's a huge deal. Um, we are going to see uh, more capabilities uh, of Lightning. And I think this is where the growth really is. I mean, yeah, we're building these solid foundations and everything else, but people building businesses and stuff on top is really interesting. Um, people building compelling content and things and getting these micropayments, right? So we've never had... It, it, it's hard. Okay. So, so when we look at what could, what could happen, it's like, well, we've never had this technology before, right? So you ask people, what would you do if... Uh, you know? You know the the early uh, user surveys about like television were like so. What would you do if you had this picture box and you're, you're like I don't have time to stop and watch the radio, right? So it's it's hard to imagine a product that doesn't exist. So suddenly you've got this ability to send one cent around the world, right? Uh, you could never do that. You couldn't send one cent online. It just didn't work. There are a whole lot of workarounds to try to make it work, but it just doesn't. You can't send a cent. Well, suddenly you can. I can literally send a cent to El Salvador and pay you know uh, about five thousandths of a cent to do it. Um, so because we never had that capability before, it's really hard to go, well, here's all the things that, that will happen. Um, but I am pretty confident there are people out there looking at this who maybe had an idea the whole time, but well, now we can make it work. This could actually work now. Cause I finally give, got that piece that was missing, which is the ability to make tiny instant payments. Um, so I'm really excited about what people build on top of this, but I'm smart enough to know that I have no idea. It'll probably be something I think is stupid when they first do it. I'll be like, that is the dumbest idea ever. Um, and it turns out it'll be like an amazing hit and everyone will love it. And it'll be like this huge growth thing for the line. That's how it goes. So, how it goes. Yeah. Always how it goes. Right. So I'm excited about the stuff that I don't know yet. Right. I'm excited about the people working on building stuff with this thing on top, um, who are, who are gonna, you know, uh, do something bold and brilliant that in retrospect, we're like, of course, we always needed that. We didn't even, you know, but from this point of view, we don't even know the world needs it. So yeah, people are building that today. And I think that's, that's an amazing to watch. 
couldn't agree more, especially what we're seeing in El Salvador right now with uh, all how Bitcoin's involved there, but also the Lightning Network and then Blockstream as well. Uh, Rusty, I want to thank you so much for your time. Uh, like you said, before the conversation started, we could sit down and hash this out for hours. So we'll definitely have to do it again, maybe later in the year when you have a moment. But from all of us at Compass, thank you so much for what you're doing for Lightning and Bitcoin. And thank you for joining us on the podcast today. <laughs> thank you for having me and keep mining. <laughs>